You know, something, this is funny. I was thinking this last night. I don't even know how you two met. Yeah. Um, we've told this story like a million times, so you just apparently don't consume our content. I try not to. <laughs> no, I met. So when I moved to Houston in 2014, and I just discovered LinkedIn. and A whole new world. Yeah. I was like, dang, I can actually just find anyone I want to find at any company and send them a message. And I mean, I had like a 95% hit rate. I sent someone a message they'd answer. I was like, this is a cheat code. And somehow I found Jake. Um, Jake at the time was working on his startup, GDSware. And um, I don't know if I'd seen you post something or just you know came up in suggestions. And I just sent him a message. It was like, hey, looks like what you're working on is interesting. We should meet for lunch. And <laughs> We met for lunch and then um uh, we met at Nico Nico's in uh Yeah. It's like Galleria. Colin showed up in like these these <laughs> these Wranglers with boots <laughs> with like a polo, like tucked in. I was like, damn. I used to wear cowboy boots every <clears throat> single day. Squirt. <laughs> I <laughs> love squirt. It, it, like I didn't see him wear tennis shoes for like two years probably. <laughs> really? Yeah. No, it was a thing. I used to wear cowboy boots every you day. You also never then, wore shorts either. Yeah. That's a complete opposite. I'm so glad that there were no cowboy boots and shorts. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Kermit thing. Kermit, yeah. Kermit wears shorts and cowboy boots. But yeah, so uh, we met and then we just kind of hit it off talking about different podcasts that we listened to. Um, at the time, there was also this website called Bigger Pockets, which is like a real estate investing website. <laughs> and we were both talking about that. So anyways, um, just started becoming friends over some mutual interests. When is that? Like 2016. 16. Early, yeah, early 16. I yeah. Think. Yeah. And then we recorded our first podcast later that year. Uh, was the one we worked? No. Or a different one? It was a different one. Oh, oh, yeah. We recorded, <laughs> we recorded this at Jake's house. This is called the podcast. It's called Fit and Wealthy. And we're here to blow your freaking minds. <laughs> <laughs> so this is episode one. So we're still figuring out exactly the direction that we want to go with this. <laughs> <laughs> Wealthy. <laughs> we still have the recording. Do you still have the I saw the recording. We, we, never can we can chop on a clip of it. We never published it because it's so cringe to listen <laughs> to. It, it, only, it only lives on my phone. It's the only place. <laughs> But I'll be I'll have my stuff on shuffle I sometimes have, and it'll come up and I'm like I've never been able to listen to more than two minutes of this thing because I'm like, God, just I want to shoot myself when I listen to it. But yeah, the podcast is called Fit and Wealthy and it was just about like business and health and like fitness, like the things that we were interested and in. And y'all were like what, twenty two at the time? I mean <laughs> twenty six. <laughs> yeah. But no. Um but it's actually funny when you listen to it, I'm like, Yeah, that was on point. That's on point. Like it was actually the, the stuff, episode was but. on your your network is your net worth, which is kind of funny to see how everything's kind of played out with just like the EW community. Yeah. But everything we said was true. Colin's voice was just like seven octaves lower and really? had a much thicker accent. Yeah. No, it's interesting. There's just been this this phenomenon that's happened with my voice ever since I started podcasting. One, I used to have a like really thick accent, but also the like my the levels of my voice were much deeper. And you go back and listen, like Julie's like, this is so weird. Like, were you pretending to sound like that? And I'm like, how would I pretend to be sounding like that? But I listened to Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan said the same thing that when he started podcasting, he lost his Boston accent and his voice changed. And I think it's something that happens subconsciously as you start recording content and podcasting, you want to become more clear and articulate. And so you start adjusting your voice to sound like that. My voice has changed too, just not as noticeably. But I'll go back and listen to the first podcast I did like seven years ago, and it's a big difference. I'm like mortified. I'm going to go back and listen to episode one. You should. And I mean, it's been a couple of years since you've been podcasting now, yeah. so it might have yeah, two, probably happened. Two a week for two years. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, go back. Like, If you want something to roast me on, go back and watch some of my old videos and podcasts, and it sounds nothing like I do today. <laughs> <laughs> the vlog we found yesterday. <laughs> yeah, so we were using DW Insight yesterday, and we found this vlog. Um and the vlog was from 2018 yeah. and we're laughing because the vlog starts 
and the hook is like there's no context to the hook to how the vlog starts it's just like yeah you want to work with us you want to make money let's do it hey we want to make money how can we make money with you let's do it like you got an idea let's do it and then it just cuts <laughs> in and i'm like what the fuck are we even talking about and so anyways i'll show you that vlog and it had nothing be, to do with the rest of the video either. yeah it'll be endless content for you to roast me on <laughs> like i need any yeah <laughs> so was that like a digital wildcatters piece of content had y'all started digital wildcatters or was that just more cringe sitting around was Jake's no it wasn't even like a table. glimmer in our eye like we no it, it was it i think that was like at the point where we started thinking about digital wildcatters so when we started the podcast in 2018 is actually in this room. This is our first podcast studio. Yeah, it's weird right to see up. it come back full circle. But um started the oil and gas startups podcast in 2018, but Digital Wildcatters wasn't a thing yet. Like we didn't think of Digital Wildcatters as a company. We just had a podcast and anyways, we just knew that content was the future and that it was the highest form of leverage. So we're like, hey, we need to start videoing and documenting. And so we hired a videographer, a full-time videographer, just to follow us around. And Jake and I were actually just talking about this yesterday because we had nothing, like we weren't doing anything. There was nothing to like actually document. It, it wasn't like video. today where we have like a million things going on that I think you could, you know, see is interesting. Whereas then it was just like, it was just, we were just trying to keep ourselves busy. I'm but with that, but with that said, like it's super, <laughs> yeah. it's super fucking cool to go back and see that. Like there's in one of those vlogs, like I'm, sitting right here and we just have these whiteboards here in a desk i'm like man if we could just make like 10 grand a month you know off this off this podcast or doing this and we can start investing in this and so you go back and you hear you forget those things like you forget yeah. those things over time and i so, don't know we were two days ago talking about man if we could just make 10 grand a month <laughs> yeah. I mean, kind of come full circle hey look i'll i'm always thinking about how we make 10 grand a month so that never changes but it's funny looking at those vlogs though like speaking of the whiteboards half the time you can go and just like pause the video and just see the things that we had written on the whiteboards and see like the goals and ambitions but also like the problems and the challenges that we were dealing with just and like how we had like kind of mind mapped it out it's it is really interesting to see after this we're gonna plug that we need to plug this clip into this podcast here because you start the vlog and me and jake are standing outside the building talking and it's me talking and then it like frames over to jake and jake's sitting there he's standing there wearing a blazer and dark sunglasses and he's just standing there <laughs> and me and julie and jake just started cracking up like why do you look like such a freak in this <laughs> So this one vlog, there's probably <laughs> enough content to like have a whole roast on. I thought I was John Wick or something. I don't know what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we, um, you know, at that time um, when we started the podcast, you know, back then, like podcasting was actually, you didn't have all this podcasting infrastructure where you could just go get Transistor or one of these softwares and just, you know, record, upload, and it would publish. You actually had to build a website with an RSS feed. And so the way that we set it up, um, Julie back then had a full-time job and she would help us part-time and she built out all the podcasting infrastructure. And then we had a podcast editor that we used overseas. And so we had a little bit of a, a, a process there. And um, back then, you know, we didn't really know what digital wildcatters would become we just knew that hey if you create content and you create this value and put value out there that something would come from that and what and i'm gonna sound i'm gonna sound kind of like an ass asking this but it's a legitimate question was it truly that that you knew you'd build a community and build value and all that or was it or was there a touch of vanity in it i just want everybody to hear me no, and, I, and I, I say that with love. I don't think there was any vanity at all. I mean, you start a podcast called Oil and Gas Startups. We literally said, we don't know if anyone will listen to this or not. What's the TAM for a podcast like that? You know, five people. And we said our selfish reasoning was like, hey, even if nothing comes from this, at least we could get some cool people in the room and increase our personal network. And so that's what we saw from it. We didn't ever see it as like, hey, we can make money from doing this or we can become, you know, influencers or celebrities we just because i was the want. opposite i was like man i want to be <laughs> we know so i want to be i a think everybody knows no, i want to i want to i want to host the the daily show i was Ooh. telling jules yesterday uh julianne the story of how we met chuck it's like in 2020 i'm sitting there in our office i get this email and all the email says colin chuck yates here call me and i had no like 
no clue who Chuck was. And I'm like, who the fuck is this dude? I remember you and, called me and you were like, yeah, some guy named Chuck Yates called me and was just like, let's talk. And I was well, like, who I the fuck to him, is Chuck Yates? I talked to him. He's like, hey, you know, he's like, I've been doing this podcast. And he's like, you know, the guys I'm doing it with, I love them. He's like, but, you know, I can't say the F word. And he's like, you know, I want to be able to do that. He's like, you know, can I record a podcast with you guys? I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> like, you knew nothing, nothing about him. Uh, 24 and, hours later, you had on LinkedIn some video of a rocket taking yeah. off. <laughs> well, what's funny is, because uh, what I was telling Julianne yesterday, I was like, I don't look at Chuck through the same lens as other people in the industry look at you. Because, <laughs> like, I've never known you from that. I was always just like, yeah, there's just some random guy that hit me up through, through email. But, um, you know, to the point, it was like, that's what we always saw the the leverage of content was you know you get this exposure you put content out there and then you know good things come from that so i think back to <clears throat> going back to a lot of the podcast now is is predominantly in done there's occasionally i'll reach out to people that you know i want to I talk with you and, and have you on the show but in the early days it was like i don't think people realize for one podcasting in the space was not common and two people speaking on podcasts was not common. So it was constantly just getting rejected, reaching out to people, being like, hey, we'd love to, love to have you on the podcast. Yeah, and tell them the like, story yeah. of trying to get the EMPs on. Oh, yeah. So I go to the, I go to the um, uh, how to get private equity to back your EMP. It was an SBE event. Tons of people there. Uh, and I remember some of these people. I remember it was um, Don Burdick was up there, who we've had on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was DRW. It was... Uh, love both those dudes. Uh, uh, mm, guy from Riverbend. Oh, uh, newcomer Randy. Newcomer, he was there. Scott Rice. Yeah. Um, and oh God, who's the other guy? The other guy slipped my mind. I can see him in my head. I know exactly <laughs> who he is. And I went up to. Um, I didn't talk to Don that day, but I talked to DRW. Talked to Randy. Talked to the other guy. And out of the three, DRW was the only one who gave me the time of day and was just like, "Yeah, I'll come on your podcast." Like, and this is before he was putting out hot take of the day. This is before podcast. Like, he right. had no content at this point. He just seemed like a guy that I would get along with based on his responses on the panel. And so he came on the podcast later and then. Which is kind of crazy because there was so much value exchange there between us and DRW because he was probably like, I don't know, episode 10 or yeah. so. And like Jake said, he wasn't putting out content yet. He wasn't putting out stuff on LinkedIn, but he had written a book. And so he was like, I want to put out content. And he came on our podcast. And I mean, that episode blew up. Um, everyone. I mean, he was so vulnerable, talked about, um, you know, just personal family challenges. Yeah, he's you know, a real this dude. company and did really well. And that was kind of the catalyst for him taking off and building a personal brand and creating all this content. And then was also um, just huge for us as well, too, because I don't think a piece of content existed like that in oil and gas where you have someone that came in, you know, moved from engineering to building a successful, successful oil company and then being so transparent and genuine and authentic in their story like that where, where would you find that content before it just didn't exist so that was actually a pretty pivotal moment from content creation from and and, and and i'll even say in the industry because you're right i mean we all you know had motherships i had la mad at me because i made a joke <laughs> on stage or whatever drw had backers you know and all that and so being kind of free to that yeah was uh was uh was cool so like okay so we're podcasting along when it, when is it like we have a company we're gonna do this yeah well let me tell let me tell give some more context okay because there's a lot of stuff that just happened in between that doesn't get talked about a lot and um i'm also going to tell a story that ties into content and one of our investors um but Jake and I, you know, we didn't really know what would come from the podcast. Um, and back then, there was two things. One, we wanted to own some oil wells. Um, and yeah, we did. So <laughs> when got a few buddies together, bought some stripper wells up in Oklahoma. And what we did was uh, with our videographers, we documented this. We said, hey, you know, we're going up to Oklahoma to look at these wells and so showed the the process of buying them and then we had to go up there and work them over so we document that and what's funny is i didn't know this story until last year so one of our biggest investors now in digital wildcatters one of our biggest supporters started out as one of our biggest haters and so bison <laughs> ventures up in oklahoma um they started off they had an upstream company moved into um 
midstream OFS and now they have tech and they were going to buy these wells and all of a sudden someone swoops in and buys them and we didn't even negotiate the price or anything we just bought them and just said yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and bought them if you and, don't know you're and the, so, and the so the seller game. tells them and you know Oklahoma is just a very tight knit community and they're like yeah some guys from Houston came and bought these wells and so Bison's like who the fuck are these guys and then a these month guys later paid list price for and then a month the later shit. they see us post this YouTube video of us doing it and so they're like these fucking clowns are like you know buying these wells and then like making YouTube videos and anyways they told me last year they're like they told me this story and I had no idea even when they invested like I had no idea about this and they uh they tell us they're like Hey, when y'all did that, like, man, we thought y'all were the biggest clowns and now we get it. You guys were just so far <laughs> ahead in the future of content creation and, and creating videos. And so anyways, you know, we were doing that and also doing some consulting work um, with some uh, tech companies and, you know, funny stories there. Like, you know, we, we helped this um, uh, positive displacement pump technology Um they were building the pump in Switzerland. And so me and Jake fly over to Switzerland and we hang out for two days with this Russian ol oligarch that was funding it. And so his son is like the biggest rapper in all of yeah, Russia. His son, he's like the Drake of Russia. Yeah. His son's name is Timothy. And he's like, I didn't have that on the bingo card this <laughs> yeah. morning. That we were going to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. There's a Russian yeah. Drake. Okay, yeah. I got yeah. It. So, um, he has like the largest house. Like this guy has like largest house in San Tropez. He's got a hundred million dollar art collection. Like, yeah, the big, like, Super yacht. The last kind of thing guy. that he told me, if I ever need anything in Moscow, to let him know. And I so, hope I don't ever need I've never, I've never called on that fear. <laughs> yeah. But, anyways, so we were just doing a bunch of things and trying to see what, uh, what would stick. And so, you know, with the podcast, what we started seeing was that it became a tangible platform where startup founders would come tell their stories and really, you know, be able to make the the story more personable not just hey you know we've developed this solution and for xyz but like actually come tell your story of how you got here and how how you solved this problem and on the flip side you'd have end users who were engineers or investors that would come to our show to, to discover these new technological solutions and so you started seeing transactions and so uh we said okay how can we take this a step further and actually bring people together and so we launched um we did it wasn't even energy tech night it was called uh what did we call that first event that we did it was like energy we did a few happy hours before that there was like an investor panel or something that we did uh startup funding panel or yeah, something so we, did and some... we had a couple like investors vcs or whatever from the space once again, I'm wearing like a freaking tie. I don't know what, I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> they have video of it. Jake's we wearing have video a, of it. He's wearing a, a tie. <laughs> but but yeah. we did it at, we did it, uh, we were at Galleria just opened up and this was, um, 2018 and we got two kegs of beer and 40 pizzas and it was so well put together that we forgot to get plates. So everyone's walking around with a red cup of beer in one hand and a slice of pizza in the other. Uh, but everyone fucking loved it. They're like, what is this? Like, we've never seen anything like this in, in oil and gas. And, you know, we work in the gallery. It was just like well designed and had a beautiful view. And so it was just like a really good ambiance and setting. And then we um, really parlayed that into the energy tech nights. And so started doing our energy tech nights that we work. And the idea there was, hey, can we get... Um, a few startups to come present and just get the right people in the room. And I mean, same thing happened there. You'd have startups come present. I mean, Corva, um, before mm -hmm. Corva was who they were, they were one of the first ones to present. I think they were on under a hundred rigs back then. Yeah. I mean, super small. Yeah. Um, Corva well database tackiest. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, tracks. Yeah. You had other companies come present that, you know, got $5 million checks from investors under their series a. So, um really just did that stuff like kind of a hobby for a couple of years from 2017 18 to 2020 we literally did everything ourselves back then and we made absolutely zero money and this was like i remember i remember specifically i don't know if it was the first one or the second one but you and i you parked your truck like four blocks down the road from we were galleria well no we took no, the kegs no, and no. The pizza and all that it was downtown. We were doing it. We moved it to we were at downtown, and there's no parking downtown. And so me and Jake would go pick up the kegs of beer from Specs, 
And then you had to park four blocks away in the parking garage, and me and Jake had to lug these kegs of beer four blocks downtown. Ke- kegs aren't light. No, they're not. No, I'm talking real like dripping sweat. We had to bring extra change of clothes. And so, yeah, we literally did everything. Um, and back then, we'd also partnered up with Sean Gear over mm-hmm. in Sean. Uh, Sean had built a successful media company and sold it to, uh, who is it, Pinwell? I think it was Pinwell. Yeah, yeah. Pinwell. And so he's kind of given us some tips. And um, anyways, you know, I think we made on, on those first ones, like we had $10,000 in, in ticket sales and sponsorships. And we're like, oh, shit, this is this is awesome. That was and all the money in the world. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It really was. Yeah. And I mean, I like cannot like. I cannot overstate how broke we were <laughs> during that that, that time. And so, yeah. <laughs> you don't realize. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, yeah. And then 2020 is when we actually started thinking about digital wall cutters as a business. And so a couple of things happened um, on a macro level. You had media podcast companies, not media companies, podcast companies starting to get acquired. So, uh, Gimlet and The Ringer both got acquired by Spotify for $200 million plus for each of them. And I was like, oh, damn. I was like, there's actually a business here in podcasting. And then uh, one thing that was really eye opening to me was when uh, Penn National acquired Barstool Sports. And it's not a great analogy now that Penn National just divested <laughs> Barstool Sports, but still, it gave us this idea. And You know, Penn National had this gambling app that they wanted to take to the market and um, but they needed distribution because you had to go up against FanDuel and DraftKings. And so they acquired Barstool Sports. Now they have this huge marketing arm in this community um, that can create content and um, be their distribution channels for the app. And so tore apart their investor relations deck and said, oh, that's the future. If You can build a community, which we've built this community through content and events. Now you can start to listen to the community and build products to serve them. And so um, that was really that was really the catalyst for us going full time on it. We decided to go full time on it uh, March of 2020, just a few weeks before oil went (laughs) negative. And so, you know, I talked to a couple painfully aware, talked to a couple of investors, um, (laughs) talked to some advertisers. And so we're like, okay, cool. We actually have something commercial here that we can go pursue. And then oil went negative and there were no investors and there were no um, advertisers. And so um, we put every dime that we had into the business in 2020 and just knuckled down and figured out, hey, it was actually kind of a unique opportunity because everyone was locked up in their house for COVID. So we said, we need to go heavy on content. Like, how can we just deliver content? We have one piece of content out there. It's a live call. It's me, Jake, David Ramsonwood and Alan Gilmer and like, we're sitting like in our bedrooms on webcams and i mean that thing did so well i I have a picture it's on my instagram from back then of uh two people in their garage watching this live video with us like hey thank you so much for creating uh this content allowing us to like have community and feel connected during covid um and so like the work that we were actually doing seemed really important there because we're allowing people to connect with each other um because you know what happened to me and then is or me during that time is i mean i wanted to go be howard stern right i wanted to tell dick jokes and laugh and you know do all my silly kind of stuff be david letterman you know all that and oil hits minus 37 everybody's in lockdown i mean I was trying to be really good because my kids were going back and forth and my ex-wife has asthma and you, we didn't know if that was a comorbidity factor. So I was being really good. So, man, I was alone in my house in Richmond. Yeah. Uh, you know, I got out and walked some, but other than that, I'm not talking to people, not seeing anyone. And so when I started recording these podcasts, I think the first one I did with Kitty and BRV, the Anons and stuff, that was funny and, you know, I was sitting there getting drunk. They were getting drunk while we did it. Yeah. But after that, it got really serious really quick. You know, talking to best friend Fish about both of us losing our job, Patrick on. And it it went a totally different direction than I thought. I didn't think I was going to be sitting there having to play the therapist to the oil and gas business. But that's kind of where it went. No, for sure. I mean, you know, if you remember like that D-Day video I made, which probably (laughs) the most successful meme I've ever made. But even if you go look at the comments like on, on YouTube, 
I went and read them the other day and um, it like hit me like people were commenting like I just lost my job but this made me laugh thank you or like my husband's going through a really tough time I showed this to him and it made him smile like we're all in this together and so um, you know it, it's interesting to see how um, content and telling stories and letting people know that they're not alone um, and that because I mean that was a scary time like we yeah, forget when, about it but it was just like I was I was I wasn't worried about me but I was worried about all my family all my friends um, and you know it's easy to forget like how how uneasy of a time that was for a lot of people well the because the the you know another big moment kind of when I was starting to podcast when energy credit one came on when uh, Jeff Davies came on, yeah, you know, he talked about blowing up a hedge fund, you know, when he was at TPH and, and he was just real about it. I mean, he mm -hmm. just owned it, you know, it wasn't like, Oh, it was somebody else's fault. He's like, no, I made the call. You know, unfortunately I was right. I was just way too early, but you know, yeah. And all that. And just the engagement I got and the inbounds on that. And yeah. And, and all it was really, really wild. Yeah. You know, I'm a big believer in community and, you look at digital wildcatters we're a very community centric company and you know it's human nature that we want to be connected with other people and surrounded by other people and i think what these content mediums have allowed us to do is to tell stories of people you know you go back to oil and gas startups like i said it's like how can you actually humanize people and tell their stories and i think that you know it it I listen to podcasts, you know, with entrepreneurs that I respect. And like when you hear them, like, you know, you hear Mark Zuckerberg on on Joe Rogan's podcast, and you know, he goes through all the same challenges that other founders have gone through, and you know, the way that he he thinks about things. I'm like, oh, that resonates with with me as well. And so, um, I think that these mediums have allowed people to connect on a on a deeper level well and you figure out too that you know an overnight success took 15 years of nights oh yeah you know sure. yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, never sure. yeah it's never that yeah. so yeah the so podcasts in a way all that industries in the tank i mean how are you making money jake <laughs> i mean we weren't yeah we, weren't. we had enough cash to last us in 2020 till the end of the year not even to the end of the year and then we did our first kind of brand deal, like essentially our first customer client, whatever you want to call it, at the end of 2020, like literally in the nick of time. Uh, and then that got us another three, four months down the road. Yeah, and we're like, cool, we bought ourselves some time to like figure out, we weren't media people, we're oil and gas guys. Like we didn't understand like how all this stuff works. And so it was just kind of like figuring out as we we're going along. Yeah, we, yeah. Um, we came up with this idea, which was called the bullpen. And you know, going back to, okay, how can we create products that serve our community? You know, Jake and I had worked on this project and we'd taken a little bit of cash away from it. And so we had enough cash to last until the end of the year. And, you know, I want to give a shout out to Maynard Holt because I spent a lot of time with Maynard back in 2020. And I don't know if you've ever been to Maynard's warehouse, but he's got this awesome. I haven't. He's got the, I mean, I used to live, I, I mean, I went to college with him. I used to live, the former Mrs. Yates has uh, yeah. the house three doors down from yeah. Maynard, but I never, I never got the invite to the so warehouse. He tells, me, he tells me to meet him at, at, his, at his place and you walk in there and, you know, it's this big metal building and walk in there and there's a big projector up on the wall and it's like playing rap videos and there's like football players like practicing in this turf area and i'm like i'm not in the right place <laughs> and then manor comes walking down it's like oh hey colin what's up and then you go up to the second story and he's got his conference rooms and i mean just it's a dream setup i love it but we spent so much time around whiteboards um talking and i, I think maynard and tph as an organization was by far the the first believers in seeing what we were building and so we built this product called the bullpen and the bullpen was a directory. It was a database on our website where um, you'd have every oil and gas tech startup and you'd go on there and they'd have their own profile page. So like back then combo curve, they weren't even combo curve. They were inside petroleum back then. Um, you go to their profile page, you'd have founder, co-founder, CEO Armand on there with his demo walking through the platform. You'd have an overview of um, who the company was. And you know, I remember getting messages like, this is one of the most innovative things that we've seen in oil and gas. I'm like, chill, it's a page on our website. <laughs> like, it's, but 
you know, to Jake's point, like we didn't make any money in 2020 and I think it was like Q4. And I mean, we're running, like we're running dry. And, um, we ended up doing a hundred thousand dollars in revenue that year. And, um, the majority of that revenue, probably 75% of it came from PPH. I'm um, doing a advertising and brand deal with us. So advertising on the podcast, sponsoring the bullpen. And so you know, I've told, you know, I told Bobby on the podcast mm-hmm. that we do with Bobby Tudor as I do, you probably don't know this is like, but TPH saved us. Like, I, <laughs> I don't know if we'd be here without TPH. And anyway, so, you know, the bullpen, Jake and I were like, okay, how can we commercialize this and actually go charge EMPs for it? You know, there's a lot of value here. And um, so we started talking to a lot of our friends at EMPs and the common thread that they came back with on feedback is like, yeah, this is great, but we also want a way to talk to our industry peers about these uh, technologies. And so I was like, oh, that's interesting. And you started seeing what was happening with like EFT over on Twitter. You know, you start having this community building up over on Twitter where people are talking and you have engineers and finance people and just started realizing that, hey, there's not a central networking platform that's built specifically for the energy industry. And so we got this idea and really started putting thought into it and um, ended up shelving the bullpen because we wanted to figure out what we were really um, doing there. And then um, as COVID started ending, you know, we, we kind of, I don't want to say we understood the events business, but we'd had success there with our energy tech nights and we knew that there was something there and everyone was doing digital events, virtual events, and people wanted us to do virtual events and we're like, no, it's lame. We're not going to do a webinar. And we got the idea for, um, evolve. And that was about the time that I think that you'd met us probably a few months, um, before evolve. Um, cause you went up there with us and we said, okay, Hey, COVID's happening, but can we kind of do this this piece of content? And we went and crushed it with Evolve. And then as soon when as- When was Evolve? Uh, that was early that, 21. I think it was yeah, March March 21. Spring, spring of, yeah. cause I was vaccinated at the time and I got vaccinated January of 2021. Yeah, yeah, I and, think it was- uh, And y'all started my podcast on October of 2020, but we didn't really didn't know each other. I was like handing y'all a podcast. Yeah, I mean we yeah, were exactly. talking. And yeah, stuff, that's what. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean you still had your office down in Richmond, so you're hanging down there. Global and, World um, Headquarters. Yeah. It was a dope tracker. office. I love that office. That's such a good office. No, I liked yeah. it a lot. It was cool. It's a yeah. Pilates studio now, but <laughs> well, is it? Yeah. Shame. So that um, so shame. that 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 spring of 21 evolve. Yep, and then as we started coming out of COVID, I think that we were probably the first company in the world to do a live event coming out of COVID. Um, I don't. The energy tech night that we did immediately after, that was the first thing we did back was the best attended energy tech night we've ever done. The energy was so high. It was like, I think it was like 450, almost 500 people. Yeah, almost had 500 people there packed. It even got memed on some of the big finance meme accounts because you had people you know, we did it at Heights Theater and next to Heights Theater, there's like a, a Fidelity or, you know, one of those brokerage, uh, yeah. large commercial brokerage firms. And there's all these guys in blue blazers lined up down the street <laughs> <laughs> underneath the sign. And so all the finance accounts are like uh, memeing that. But um, yeah, that was that that energy just was unmatched because people have been pen, pen up for yeah. almost two years. And um, and so gravitated towards the events a uh, couple of reasons you know one this industry is just really conditioned for events they understand it but two it's been it's such a good medium for building community and if you look at the events in this industry i mean just to be blunt they suck and their trade shows and they're very rigid and hard to make connections and we well i mean when you think about nape it's not nape it's the Four Seasons Bar. It's being at Keneally's. It's the Hill of Americas. Night. It's the yeah, opportune party. Exactly. And so yeah. our, we were like, how can we create a party and then inject content and valuable information into that to make it valuable for people and really develop this thesis of collisions? And what we saw was that we just enabled this environment where you removed all the friction and took down barriers to where people could actually meet each other and be comfortable. And um really saw that those collisions were the, the the catalyst for ideas and collaboration and opportunity and I, I mean like one of one of the things like i'm most proud about personally is 
you know, after every energy tech night, after every fuse, after every empower, we get all of this, th these testimonials and case studies of people uh, and companies getting value out of it. You know, from this recent one that we just did up in Oklahoma City with Marty. Um, is it all right if I tell yeah, you yeah, yeah. publicly? Yeah. Um, you know, Marty was working on a seed financing for his company and one and a half million dollar seed financing had an investor the investor was hardballing him on some terms marty's like i'm not doing that and he comes and does energy tech night on thursday wins energy tech night closes the deal that next monday and says that winning energy tech night directly affected him closing that that deal and getting the terms that he wanted and that's fucking awesome and then on top of that he sent me like screenshots of like 10 messages from other investors reaching out, want to talk, new customers, like totally game changing for him. So, yeah, so the, the events for us have been, really I think there's another the inside community. baseball thing that I, I think about sometimes that I don't think people realize in the early days, I remember a comment made from uh, Ryan Gurney over at Montrose. He was just like, you guys are doing some like really, you know, meaningful work here. I don't think you guys like realize it. This is like the early, early days, but whenever you're creating, I'm curious to hear your perspective on this, whenever you're creating podcast or any other sort of content like it can be a little bit of a lonely existence because you're just putting things out of the ether and your only feedback loop is like likes comments impressions things like that and most people don't really like engage in that way they just kind of come across it maybe they appreciate it uh maybe they don't uh but then when you add in the events and you have those in-person connections where people come into the office you get that feedback loop of like yeah like we raised we raised funding oh you know i closed two clients like oh like this has led to me getting a new job or this has like changed my life in some way and so that I think it helps continue to be a catalyst for like continuing to do what we do because you see the results of it. Whereas if it's like purely just content, I think sometimes it's hard to do I that. I think that's funny. Like one of the only podcasts I've ever listened to like consistently is Noah Kagan's podcast. And so I love Noah Kagan because he was employee number 13 at Facebook and, uh, essentially he got fired by Zuckerberg because Zuckerberg's like, you got to quit doing your blog and no, it told him to get fucked. And then he goes over to Mint. Same thing. He's like, first 10 employee at Mint. Same thing happens. And he relinquishes all of his equity. And so like these billion dollar companies and just does not give a damn. And anyways, it goes on to create his own uh, nearly billion dollar company, AppSumo. And anyways, he had this uh, blog post once about um, uh, Tony Robbins <laughs> events. And I mean, it was like from like, six years ago and anyways um i went to one of my friend's birthday parties in austin uh a year or two ago and i didn't know this but him and noah kagan are best friends and so noah was there noah's talking to someone and i walk up to him and i was like hey guys like mind if i join and noah's like yeah you know we're just talking about tony robbins here i was like yeah that blog post that you wrote six years ago was perfect and his eyes got all big he's like you actually read that <laughs> and he's like that's so cool to hear that. like someone actually reads my stuff so you create podcasts and then jake said you don't get that feedback loop like you know, you just sit here and, and record content and um, it's really cool when someone references something that you talked about. When I was talking to the Petroleum Alliance of Oklahoma about a month ago, uh, I was speaking at their Wildcatters launch. I, mean, I said two stories like that. One, the girlfriend wanted to go to Sardinia. I didn't even know where Sardinia was. <laughs> like, I was like, can, you know, what are we talking about? Yeah, when you told me y'all were going there, I was like, I have no clue. That, I couldn't point that out. That sounds too rich for me. I like, <laughs> Island in the Mediterranean, an Italian island in the Mediterranean. So think Sicily, next big island up. I'm like, oh, okay. So we anyway, we went there. We're laying out by the pool, and somebody walks over to me. Hey, man, I just want you to know I'm a big fan of your podcast. <laughs> in and Sardinia? In Sardinia. <laughs> like in a small town in Sardinia. And uh, That's the girlfriend's just like, oh, jeez, good God, really? Julie rolls her eyes so hard yeah. anytime, that, anytime that happens. But the greatest, because you know Chuck, you know Chuck's just eating it up. Ego totally. just inflated, just, like. <laughs> <laughs> Although in I'm Chuck Yates, everyone knows me. <laughs> what was your favorite podcast that I did? <laughs> in in all fairness, though, I've gotten to the point in my life. I like the likes. I don't need the likes. I am. I well, am that's there. good. That's I, growth. I am there. But the greatest example of this is my daughter Sarah is going with a bunch of people to cotillion, you know, a dance. Yeah. And, you know, she doesn't know everybody in the group and all her friend's date that she was sitting next to, you know, Sarah goes, hey, I'm Sarah Yates. And he goes, oh my God, is your dad Chuck Yates? <laughs> and Sarah just went, 
Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Sounds- yeah. <laughs> And, and he goes, oh, my God, I listened to your dad's podcast. It's so great. I want to get into energy one day. And, uh, and I'm willing to cut that kid a million-dollar check. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come to me but, when you need funding. <laughs> but, yeah, exactly. but it's like it, it is so amazing, the power. I mean, I, I've got – there's a garbage crew in, Port, in uh, Seattle that emails me about twice a year hey, we listen to your podcast. We want to know about this, this, and this. They don't know anything about energy. They're, I mean, literally listening yeah. to it. They all t- they I work with their shirt off. You yeah. know, I mean, they're no, picking up garbage. Yeah. And then there's a, there's a guy in Japan who sends me an email and about once a year, w- twice a year in broken English. You know, here are the 12 podcasts I listen to what happened. It's broken English. Yeah. You know, it's supposedly one of the nuclear subs in the Navy. Yeah. Is listening to my podcast Friday morning. That's amazing. That's yeah, like, it's crazy. The reach you this can This guy have. hit me up on Twitter the other day and he's like, hey, he's like, um, he's a, a officer in the US Army and he's like, I was wearing one of y'all's digital wildcatters and power shirts in Iraq. He's like, my dad was at one of the Houston Bitcoin meetups and got one of y'all's shirts and sent it to me and that's how he discovered us and I was like, that's cool. I was like, you gotta be the first person to sport our merch in Iraq. <laughs> 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 I know of, but yeah, it, um, you know, content allows you to, I mean, just get reach that, I mean, it, it really, if you think about it, you know, it's like, if you can get a thousand listeners on a podcast, which that's not a, it's not a huge podcast, you know, um, compared to the Joe Rogans of the world, but think about a thousand people being in a room it's listening, a lot, yeah. and then that's distributed across think the world. Most conferences in our space are like 500, 800 people. Yeah. yeah. Right. You get 500, 800 downloads. People are like, oh, it's not a lot. No, it's like, that's a lot of people listening to something. Yeah. You know what's also like crazy about audio? Do y'all remember Kid Craddock? Yeah. Y'all, yeah. So yeah, yeah. in the oil field, I don't know. I don't know why we had this deep of a relationship with Kid Craddock as oil field hands, but I think it was because he was just, you're going out at 4 30 in the morning. Like that's what was on radio, like talk radio. And so we all listened to Kid Craddock and, he passed away i think he had a heart attack it was something sudden and all the oil field hands like we felt sad like we lost a friend i've never even seen kid i don't even know what he looks like but that connection that you had with audio and just listening to someone every single day and then all of a sudden you know they pass away it's like you know you like lost a piece of you and so um i think audio content especially is super interesting and in well in that you know aspect. it's interesting today because we sit there and we talk about news and media and all three most trusted news sources in america if you look at any poll or some version of the of these three number one oprah and you kind of get that i mean she's had her talk show and all that but oprah's been real i mean she talked about losing her virginity because a guy gave her a popsicle you know mm-hmm. and and all that it's howard stern Mm-hmm. I mean, for all of Howard Stern's jokes and being canceled and stuff, might be the best interviewer in America. I mean, he yeah. gets celebrities to talk about real things. He's authentic. He's genuine. And then it's Joe Rogan. Yeah. I mean, those are your three most trusted news sources. Yeah. It's not ABC, CBS, CNN, any yeah. of that. And I think that major media continues to diminish over time because, like, I can't tell you. Last The only time I've ever watched news channels is you know i grew up with my grandparents and my grandfather would have fox news on 24 yeah. 7 and then offshore rigs in the gulf of mexico the only thing that they play on tv is fox news and so that's like the only exposure but um, do you know why the do you know why the uh, fox news logo in the bottom left corner spins no because <laughs> only you would know this useless <laughs> information this. my mom <laughs> reached out to David Rhodes, who David Rhodes is a college friend of the Yates brothers because we were all at Rice. He went to Rice. Turns out my dad and his dad went to Rice. Turns out even weirder story, my grandfather delivered his father because he grew up in <laughs> Baytown. His mom, you know, mom's driving through Rosenberg, Texas, goes into labor. My grandfather's so the weird. only doctor. So <laughs> Rhodes family never paid the Yates family for that delivery, but that's another story. But anyway, uh, David Rhodes was Roger Ailes's right hand man, kind of at Fox News. And my mom uh, called David one day, and you know, of course, David took the phone call. And she's like, "You're starting to burn something into my TV because I just <laughs> watch like Fox TV News. Like- I just watch Fox News all day." And so, anyway, 
48 hours later it starts spinning <laughs> that's yeah. pretty interesting yeah. actually yeah 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 i remember the old tvs like it, yeah it'd burn in there if you had an image on there too long so <laughs> <laughs> so so because this is kind of interesting i actually don't think a lot of people know this i know this because i at some point i started showing up here every day just because <laughs> i figured that's better than day drinking at my house yeah which wouldn't end well but like what stuff is happening now at digital wildcatters? Cause when I tell people this stuff, they have no idea. Yeah, no, I mean, same here when, you know, we're starting to talk about some of the things that we've been building and I think people's reactions are like, why haven't y'all been talking about this? And you know, it's one, it's cause we've been building um, slowly and, and being deliberate about how we do it. You know, we're not a, heavily funded startup like out of silicon valley where you just have infinite resources to build you know when you're building a company you can build cheap and slow or expensive and fast <laughs> and um you know we've we've kind of landed in the in the middle there but what our thesis is as a company is you know again very community centric how can we build things that enable our community to solve the world's energy crisis. And what we've landed on is building this vertically integrated professional network. And so if you look at the evolution of the internet, sorry, I'm gonna get like really nerdy here and talk about this, but- Wank out, dude. But I think that it's important to understand where the internet's going. Um, you look at web one, web one was static forums, messaging boards, you know, think AOL Instant Messenger, Craigslist, things of this nature. Web2, who Web2 was actually coined by LinkedIn and their Series B deck, was all of these huge horizontal social media platforms. MySpace, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, you know, go down the list. And it's really interesting if you listen to how Mark Zuckerberg talked about Facebook back around 2009, 2010, because they started off just for college students. and It's a directory, getting, essentially. It, yeah, and but getting college students together in person and he said we're not a he's like we're not a social media network or a community platform and we're reflecting the things that we do in person in a digital environment and anyways that's not where they ended up going um what these uh large social media platforms did was connected everyone around the world and then enabled people to be creators which is great but the problem is and i think instagram is kind of the best example of this is Remember Instagram before they got bought by Facebook was a place where you could like I'd follow Jake and like see his pictures and like it was like very personal and you're actually following and connected with people that you know. You go to Instagram now and it's very algorithmic driven content by creators with, you know, reels and things of this nature. And so what people are missing is that community aspect um, online. And so what you're seeing now as we move into the next evolution of the internet is these vertical platforms that are built specifically for A, industries, or B, groups of people. So this isn't just specific to digital wildcatters. I mean, we've seen this happen in other industries, like Doximity did it for doctors and nurses. Um, I've seen... Uh, community platforms for pickleball players, um, freightways you know, and trucking. Yeah, you know, There's one of my friends, one, bigger uh, pockets, like you Gino, mentioned, Gino and uh, Jason um, are two of the best wrestlers in the world. Their platform, Ocean, is a community platform for wrestlers, and so that's what you're really starting to see is these verticalized platforms for specific groups of people that can serve them better. And so that's really what we're building. Because um, if you think about it, I mean. My in my business career, read the Wall Street Journal, watched CNBC, and then when LinkedIn finally showed up, that's kind of what you did. Yeah, and yeah, that gave you a good broad overview. But anytime they wrote an article about energy, like oh man, those idiots don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, you know, <laughs> no, that's so a, you realize how little mainstream media knows about topics when they write something about a topic that you understand yeah. um, very deeply and. You know, so for us, if you look at like what our what our mission is at Digital Wildcatters, we want to enable our community of energy professionals to solve the world's energy crisis. And we want to provide the platform and resources for them to be able to do that. And so I think, you know, like us, there will be other platforms out there. You know, you even see this with, um, I don't want to get like crypto, but talk like, like board apes, but board apes started yeah. off as like digital assets. Then they said, okay, Hey, let's get everyone together in person for parties. 
And now they're creating tech products for that community of people. And so these platforms, they're not just digital social media platforms, they're actual in real life elements too, and getting people together in person and then just reinforcing that with a central platform. And so, you know, the way that we see our app collide and it's funny, someone, I didn't realize how similar the name collide is to Colin. Um, until last week, because I wrote out Collide on paper, and then I was like, "That's like, dude, that's a lot like my name." Someone on Twitter called it out last week. They're like, "Oh, does Colin just name this app after him?" <laughs> I was, and, but you know, the reason that we named it Collide was off of that thesis, this, that thesis of collisions from our events. Those same types of collisions that we've been really successful with at our events, we want those to happen in a digital environment as well. And so, you know, when you look at Collide. I like telling people it's kind of like the Stack Overflow of energy. Stack Overflow built this community platform where if you're a software developer, you could come ask a question about your code and the community would answer it. And then, boom, that question would be indexed. That way, the next time someone came along, they could search for it, find the information that they needed. And if they couldn't find it, they could ask the community and get an answer. We want that same type of platform uh, to well, exist in energy. And, and I want to say something to the old CEOs that have stumbled across this podcast and actually figured out how to listen to it. So your peers? My peers. <laughs> exactly. You know, I'm 55 next week. Yeah. Dang. 55 next week. But no, two things that I think are really important, I, and, and I think I'm going to try to write a really cool speech about this and run around and start giving it, is number one, kids today are digitally native. I mean, you guys all grew up with phones and social media and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So energy, if you're not leading edge digital stuff, of course we're not gonna attract any new talent. We sit there and we talk, like the old guys, we talk, oh yeah, it's volatile and people talk bad about us. I'm like, no, when did you, when's the last time you gave someone a digital app that could interact with their peers and stuff? You yeah. know, I mean, that's how the rest of the world well, does it. You know, the when we were getting that feedback back in 2020, you know, hey, we want to discuss these topics with our industry peers. And there was a second part to that without being reprimanded by our employers. Yeah. And this industry has always really struggled with um, how people do business online. But to your point is, yeah, you know, hey, these kids have grown up digitally native. Well, I mean, me and Jake are probably like halfway through the millennial generation. I mean, millennials are 40 years old now. Um, you know, me and Jake are 33. But even for us, the iPhone came out in 2007. It's my thing. It was right, it was we're right juniors. before Obama. Yeah, yeah. we're juniors. Election. In, yeah, you know, we're juniors in high school. I mean, people that are mine and Jake's age, if you're young 30s, like we are the last people that remember life before the internet. And I mean, there was only no. about. My first cell phone was a Nokia. So like I didn't come into the iPhone. That, yeah. was like, that was like four phones away from me. But I mean, yeah. you know, I remember getting my first house home computer when I was like eight. And so yeah. there was only about, you know. We had like an Apple II. Yeah. <laughs> like so literally one of the first about computers. about six or seven years. I had a Commodore, pet, uh, Commodore 64 or whatever. But yeah. now, like you extrapolate, like you look at my kids. I mean, dude, most of my parenting fights that I have to break up happen on the metaverse. You know, they're over in Roblox <laughs> and, you know, they're wearing VR headsets like, yo, Quit knocking my house down. I'm like, y'all aren't even fighting in the real world. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's the thing is if you look at, I think these are the two biggest problems in energy. And actually, I saw someone quote a EMP CEO on Twitter about this the other day that said, um, this isn't verbatim, but it, it'll capture the sentiment. It said, you, the biggest challenge to growing oil and gas production is attracting talent to this industry. And the problem is, is you have two problems in this industry. One is recruiting. Doesn't matter if you talk to HR departments at EMPs, OFS, mm -hmm. renewables, climate tech, everyone has the same problem. We cannot find qualified talent. Can't find qualified talent within the industry. They'll tell you, you know, we get applicants from LinkedIn and Indeed, but they're not qualified talent. Reason is those are horizontal platforms. You have people from all different industries and backgrounds. And then there's a top of funnel problem, attracting talent to the industry. You go over on my TikTok, you go on Digital Wildcatters YouTube, you'll find comments of like, hey, this is really cool. How can I work in oil and gas? How can I get in the industry? So we think with Collide, uh, part of the Collide platform will be a, a recruiting uh, solution in helping people in our community 
uh, connect with their uh, next gig and accelerate their career and then help the companies in our ecosystem find the qualified Which talent that they need. We've already been doing manually literally since day one. If somebody reaches out like, hey, I'm looking for a job or a company reaches out and say, hey, I'm looking to hire, you know, hey, a head of sales or something. We've done this matchmaking for five or six years. Yeah. Like just, through text messages and through email. We've never made a single dollar off doing it, but it's just being kind of an accessory to the community. You can do that at scale. And it's not even just within oil and gas. I mean, I can't tell yeah. you how many messages I get from, hey, I'm a climate tech company working on CCUS based in San Francisco. We just raised a Series A. We're looking for a 15-year engineer from oil and gas, probably worked at EPC got experience in permitting um, or, hey, we need an oil and gas engineer that's familiar with this uh, chemical process. And so I think that, you know, that is a huge challenge, uh, not only for oil and gas, but the energy industry as a whole. And the second main problem. Well, hold on. While we're on that problem, because there's something that I've seen that, you know, there's so much of a tenure system in oil and gas. I'm there 15 years and I finally get promoted to VP. Technology, I show up at Facebook, I kick butt, I'm marketing director for mm -hmm. the West Coast and I'm 24. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I think one of the things we've talked about with this app is, you know, if we have anonymous folks on the app that are interacting and you can tell, wow, that person really gets it and all, you know, hopefully we're going to have the wherewithal to say, hey, you should talk to this person. Yeah. Their resume not may not reflect it, but go read their well, threads. We call you it know? internally, we call it creating the dynamic resume. And so if you look at the tech industry and you're a software developer, you can say, hey, here's my GitHub. You can check out my contributions. Hey, give me a coding test. I'll take your coding test. You can show proof of work and true skill and ability. And that doesn't exist for the most technical workforce in the world, which is the energy workforce. And so all you have right now is static resume. And you know LinkedIn does a good job of this, um, but you can say, hey. Um, where you've worked. Yeah, to where I've worked. Hey, I worked at Pioneer Natural Resources for five years. I worked at Exxon for six, but that doesn't tell someone's true ability and skill. And, you know, a, a good story I like to tell people is, you know, over on Twitter, um, most of the community runs under anonymity and this uh, Anon profile. We did a meetup here one night at our office and, you know, everyone started drinking beer and started getting loose lips. And uh, there's this account that was always uh, contributing to conversations and really smart uh, person. And I was like, all right, you know, this is probably a, a 10 year investment banker you know probably 31 years old they're 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 experienced enough to know what they're talking about but they're young enough to be hip with meme culture and so that's what i pegged them for and anyways we do this meetup this this account shows up and tells me that they're that account it's a 23 year old kid first year banker and that opened my eyes because i didn't have any preconceived bias about his ability or skill because I just, I didn't know who he was on the internet. And I was just like, this guy's smart. He knows what he's talking about. And then comes in and um, was able to you know, kind of blew my mind with that. And so being able to create this dynamic resume is something that I'm super passionate about solving this problem, because I think that you can take different elements of gamification and uh, credentials and combine them. What I mean by that is like over on Collide, you know, we're, and Clyde, we're still in the early stages of this and we'll continue to build it out and make it more robust over time. But, you know, instead of getting likes, you know, instead of just having like a heart, there's a lightning bolt and um, the gamification system is going to be based around like watts. Like every time you get a like, it's a watt. And um, you're a, um, you know, say that you're a production engineer and you're always talking about artificial lift and answering questions and contributing and you're getting a lot of watts from your peers. Now you go to apply for a job at Pioneer Natural Resources and they see this and they're like, oh, Sarah over here is super experienced. Um, here's her background on a resume. But now you have this qualitative element too where they're actually really involved in the community and have all of this social proof and validation from their peers that um, they're they're contributing and um, getting this recognition for. And so- And, and it's gonna be, their conversation is gonna be indexed. Huh, what do they know about production? 
you know, yeah. boom, pull it up and read it. Oh, yeah. okay. That makes no, sense. Exactly. Yeah. And I also think that, you know, it, on the flip side, Pioneer comes it's like, Hey, we need a production engineer that, you know, it's good with this. We'll be able to help them, um, connect with, Hey, here's our leaderboard of these people in these yep. categories yeah. who have, yep. you know, tons of Watts. Yeah. We'll be able to link them up and help them. And so the, you know, if you look at the recruiting process now, it's a very, in human process um chuck you probably don't know this i don't know the last time you applied for a job was but um you go apply <laughs> you go I kind apply. of feel like i am right now <laughs> yeah. but go ahead <laughs> you go apply for a job and you know john on our team is just great example of this you go apply for a job and all of these companies have online appliant uh, applicant tracker systems, ATSs, and they're all um, driven by algorithms and you go apply and one thing happens um or a couple things happens one thing is you never hear anything back it just gets lost into this black hole uh, you might just get a rejection letter immediately because you didn't match the keywords um it's a very broken process for both sides of the market i mean look i hire here at digital wildcatters and it's a very uh qualitative process i can never just hire someone by looking at their resume and saying yep that's the person um and on the flip side it's very discouraging and demoralizing for people in the workforce to go sit there and apply for 30 jobs and you just never even it it, it feels like you're not getting any traction and well so, well and two it's it's my dad didn't go to school with his dad and yeah. that really sucks yeah and so I think that we're really going to be able to solve that problem. And then the second main problem that this industry has that we're solving is knowledge retention and transfer. And this can be broken down in a couple of different facets. But one, if you look at people my age, came into the industry 2010, you know, I saw a little bit of conventionals, drilled some conventional wells, but then boom, it was all shale this manufacturing process in oil and gas you have a very bimodal distribution of age you have the boomers no one in between and you have millennials and now what we're seeing is that there's going to be no gen z coming into this industry as well what's happened though is the boomers are leaving the industry and this is happening now and they're taking this tribal knowledge with them of how to find oil and drill conventional assets a lot of the younger generation doesn't have that skill set. And that's just like one example. Now, if you look at knowledge transfer across the industry or even going within companies, you know, companies have a bunch of divisions and don't have the ability to, to transfer knowledge. We think that we're going to solve that problem. But if you really scale out to a, a broader view of energy, you look at this knowledge graph, oil and gas is at the center of it. Oil and gas powers 80% of the world, but you have these adjacent energy verticals that are starting to grow, whether it's uh, renewables, CCUS, geothermal. Uh, My boys in nukes are coming back. Yeah. But I'll keep fighting that fight. Yeah. Yeah. yeah nuclear, uh, battery storage, whatever. All of these things are interconnected and intertwined. And all of these adjacent energy verticals are dependent on expertise and resources from the oil and gas industry. And so really being able to build this knowledge graph and the social graph that connects everyone. And so now, hey, instead of calling me up, you know, do you know an a engineer that's familiar with this chemical process for our battery technology? Um, you can come on the platform and find those people yourselves. Like really what I want Clyde to be is if you're looking for any piece of information, you need a subject matter expert or you're looking for your next gig in energy, it happens on Collide. Well, and if we're going to have a transition, it's got to leverage the existing infrastructure. No, and so we, yeah. we're, we're, not, we're not silos anymore. One of the coolest things I had happen is last year at Fuse, kind of our South by Southwest of energy technology, the conference we do, is a renewables guy came up to me and said, Chuck, I need to meet an oil and gas guy. And I'm like, all right, sure. And found an oil and gas guy. We all went and had a beer. I would have given anything if I could have recorded that hour and a half conversation because the renewables guy was just like, hey, I need to pick your brain because we're going to have to scale. And nobody has scaled like the oil and gas business. And just all the issues associated with it, uh, you know, I got no clue. And the oil and gas guy starts talking. And I mean, the guy's feverishly taking notes. And yeah. It well, was you know, just great interaction. And, and I can't so, remember if it was Orsted or which wind uh, uh, operator it was, but this happened a year and a half or two years ago. They have this uh, 
uh, offshore wind farm, I think it was in the North Sea, and ended up taking a billion dollar loss on it because their uh, transfer cables on the subsea floor um, got torn up by rocks. And I'm like, what industry has been running subsea <laughs> infrastructure and cables for decades, oil and gas? And so um, it, it's just like a good example of, hey, oil and gas is... And, Elon Musk is actually doing a great job. Elon Musk has been picking off oil and gas engineers um, for SpaceX to go work on their offshore installations. Um, you know, they bought this Nat gas mm -hmm. field uh, for fuel down in Eagleford. And I know people personally that are petroleum engineers that have been picked off by SpaceX. And so Elon gets it. It's like, hey, we're going to go to the industry that understands how to scale infrastructure and build things. And so um, you know, that's for us. I mean, one, we're very pro-energy, energy maximalist and understand that oil and gas and the workforce plays an extremely important part in the future of uh, powering the world. And we want to be able to enable those things to happen. So, so one soapbox I've got that I want to add to this, and again, I'm going to have to figure out the funny way to give this speech and run around and start giving it, but everybody in the oil and gas business had a time in their career where they had some information and they made a great deal because they had that information and they kept it private and all. Unfortunately, you've given away whatever that gain was, you've given away 15x that gain in your career because you tight hole everything. Shit that doesn't have to be tight hold, you just hold on to it and <laughs> you know it's me and Chuck are sitting I won't I won't I won't call out the private equity fund by name, but a large private equity fund in oil and gas and we're sitting there and you know I'm telling them about Collide. And we're talking about this, you know, the idea because they asked about like proprietary data. I'm like, how much money did you guys lose in your portfolio companies and parent child uh, uh, issues? And I was like, if you would have just shared information and talked with other operators in that county, you guys could have actually all made more money and not completely fucked up your assets, right? And yeah. You say that and it's like, oh yeah, you know, you're probably right. Like all all boats rise with the well, tide. And that's I've one of the number one things that I've got. Like even in just recent conversations, talking about things like DW Insight, it's like, oh, what about proprietary information? And it's like, you don't realize that most of shit's not as proprietary as you really think it is. Yeah. Yeah. And and that and that's my point, because I've got a buddy that's a software engineer, Silicon Valley, doesn't know anything about oil and gas. But really good friend, listens to podcasts and always kind of like wants to deep dive with me on stuff. He thinks it is crazy, like batshit crazy that we don't share information. He's like, we're on Stack Overflow and he works for one of the large ones. So I'll yeah. just say Company X. He goes, I go on there and I ask a question. Hey, I need some help with this, this and this. Company Y answers me. Yeah. Because we all realize that if we share this sort of stuff, we're all better off. And I'm not talking oligopoly yeah. stuff, but he just spacing to him is the craziest thing on the planet. He's like, y'all don't all get together. Y'all don't all share technical data and all yeah. this. And I go, well, there might be five acres out there that so, someone doesn't know. You know, let me you give know. some credit to the industry. First, let me tell a story because, you know, I remember uh, running this expandable liner on a well out in West Texas and it was in the spray berry. And I remember the company man calling his previous company. He's like, Hey, what did y'all see uh, for losses when you were in this, in this zone? And like, they're talking on the phone, right? Because he knows someone personally and yeah. they're talking, but let me give some credit to the industry over the last couple of years. I mean, I think that this is a generational thing that's being driven by millennials. Um, millennials have kind of more of that open source mindset of right. information sharing um but you know i talked to an operator and they're like yeah we have a data sharing agreement with 20 other operators in this county in west texas we can share information we don't have a way to actually talk to them <laughs> and <laughs> and do it um you talk to uh there's a large EMP um, out in West Texas that's a friend of ours that has started organizing these closed door Chatham House rules uh, conversations with other engineers from you know 20 or 30 other operators. Some of them come in person, some of them hop on Zoom. And so this is happening. People, people fly in for these things yeah. too. Like, well, and my whole, my whole point is it's always happened because the service guy gets drunk on the weekend and talks. Oh yeah. The service guy goes to the competitor, hey, your competitor's doing this because they want to sell more. My whole thing is put some transparency to it 
yeah. and some openness to it and some gamification to it yeah. so that it happens efficiently it's raising as opposed to this ad hoc type way. It's raising the it. IQ of the workforce. Yeah. Um, and Because everybody knows everything. Yeah. There is literally no zone out there that is undetected. There is no big hammer to hit. There's no technology hiding out there yeah. that is, is going to be a 10x. Exactly. Or, yeah. And you know, one interesting thing that we've got from our feedback in our conversations is we've had several companies now from EMPs to large OFS that have asked us, and I'm talking like across the spectrum, like one of these EMPs is a major, one is one of the largest independents, and then the OFS is one of the lar largest OFS. And they say, this is awesome. Like next step, can you build us an internal instance as well? So now if we do have anything that's super proprietary, our employees can talk about it internally. But then we can also layer, you know, a big part of our platform is with this knowledge graph is um, machine learning components and being able to take information. You know, what I want this app to be is like having a thousand engineers right in your pocket where you can go ask any question about energy and you can get an answer right away. And all of these companies have these internal data sets that they want to leverage as well. And so they're asking like, hey, how can we build an internal instance of Collide to where our employees can share more liberally um, proprietary information and then also draw draw down on our internal um, knowledge base as well. Because one, so, one of the companies, I'll be a little coy on names just because I don't know if I can talk about this, but uses AI to run Lyft. Mm -hmm. And when actually allowed to implement it, let the AI drive it about 80% of the time, you're running the, the, the Lyft too quickly leads to burnout, leads to more replacement. Yeah, you sacrifice a quarter of a, a barrel yeah, a day production. in production, yeah. but at the end of the day, you're way more profitable yeah. by doing it. And so yeah. the, the other thing, having digital stuff gets us away from the culture of, well, we've been doing this for 30 years, yeah. you know? And I think that's important I think too. there's been some, you know, this industry has been talking about the great crew change for a long time. Um, but I think it's actually finally happening. And also with that, I think COVID was a catalyst for adoption of new technology. Um, you know, when you have negative $40 oil, you're looking at how can we extract more value out of our asset? How can we become more efficient? And so that naturally leads to, you know, adopting these new types of technology. So I think it's a pretty exciting time in the industry from that perspective. So I was talking to Ryan Rice last night. I don't think he would mind if I shared this. We almost needed $35 oil for about another year longer mm -hmm. to really, because we've kind of like. Yeah, you get away it, from it a little we bit. We get away yeah. from it a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So, so yeah, no, so, okay, I've gotten off my soapbox. I'll quit griping about it. But yeah. the, uh, the, the last thing I want to talk about because I think this is really cool, is DW Insights. Yeah. Um, Are we allowed to talk about that? <laughs> I no. like, did no, I we talk about DW Insights. Yeah, did so the I, podcast. I'm trying to think about how we, so, you know, we talked about the bullpen earlier um, and how we shelved it. And the thing was, was that was so, that product was so valuable to the ecosystem Actually, J Jake just told me um, a story two weeks ago. We just found this out that one of the first companies that we had on the bullpen, um, they came on there and they got acquired last year. Apparently made a good bit of money on it. And the company that acquired them found them from the bullpen. They said that if it wasn't for the bullpen, that transaction wouldn't have ever, wouldn't have ever happened. And so anyways, long story short, decided to bring it back. Bullpen was a terrible name. Uh, Rebranded it to DW Insight, and DW Insight is going to be a subscription product um, for EMPs uh, mainly, and then I think financial institutions, private equity funds, um, hedge funds, VCs will also have an interest in it. You know, maybe some OFS companies. But there's two parts to the platform uh, to the product. The first part is a startup database and so you come on there and we've already started onboarding a ton of energy tech startups um, each startup has their demo overview who their clients are additional content you know if they've presented at an energy tech night or they've been on a podcast we'll have that video up in there 
And what this is great for is that as simple as it sounds, this just does not exist. Um, th there's not a platform out there um, like this. And so now if you're a EMP and just pick a topic, you know, uh, it could be artificial lift optimization or methane mitigation, boom, you can come in here, low pressure environment, you're not getting sold and you can um, get an overview and see what companies are out there. And then boom, if I want to talk to them, you can you can reach out and talk to them. The alternative to that is if you're looking for something, really the only resources are the stuff that we're producing. So like, well, when I got started podcast, but do you want to go through five years of podcast to like find what you're looking for around, say, like emissions tech or artificial lift? Yeah. Same thing with like Energy Tech Night with the companies that are presenting. It's really so, a discoverability issue. Yeah. yeah. So it, yeah. it channels all of that. So this entire ecosystem of companies that we've ever talked with or, or just kind of on our radar, now you have a centralized platform to be able to go and filter down and search for exactly what you're looking for. Yeah. And the second part of the product is we have created this content search engine. And right now we've uploaded all of our content. So all of our videos from all of our podcasts, all of our video recordings from panels and sessions at our events. And we've even started bringing in third party content. Now we have, uh, uh, the distributed energy resources podcast on there. We have Yoshi's podcast on there, which he's a, uh, she reservoir engineer, right? reservoir, yeah, engineer, reservoir engineer, engineer, super intelligent, um, very smart engineer and she has a podcast that's uh, around oil and gas engineering content so we have brought that in there and we've built it on a machine learning model to where you can come in there and hey now you're that production engineer and you're trying to figure out what you're doing on methane emissions i don't have six hours to listen to a podcast boom i type in methane emissions instantly pops up every single piece of content that we have on the platform gives you a transcript um soon we'll even have further capability to where you can get hey i want the five bullet points on this tell me the timestamp. That way you can really streamline information. And we think that this product is going to be, we're already using it internally. That's how we knew that it was going to be great because we use it internally um, for research. Um, it is so much easier to go search on DW Insight. Like when I did um, Energy Tech Night in Midland, we had uh, Duke um, do the interview. And I went to DW Insight, typed in his name, boom. I mean, half a second, his video came up and I got what I needed go over to YouTube. It was, I mean, it's it was very a, difficult to find. It was a difficult process to actually find it over on YouTube. And so what all right, you know, what we really want to be able to do in the future is, um, you know, take information, this unstructured information, you know, some engineers are talking about artificial lift on collide, take that information, take all the content that we create with subject matter experts at digital wildcatters through our podcasts and events, and then bring in third party information, um, from, you know, I, I think that SPE, APG, SGE, these technical organizations, uh, people like Yoshi that have their podcasts, and all of a sudden we have this uh, very robust knowledge graph that can be used to find uh, whatever piece of information that you need. So DW Insight is, it's a uh, content subscription product um, on the Collide platform, and we just started rolling that out um, a few weeks ago. And um talking to ENPs and private equity funds and the reception has been extremely uh, positive to it. We think that that's going to be a powerful tool. For well, you know, why it's I really, really great batting average. You know, yeah. why I hate it. <laughs> you know, why I hate it. Y'all are going to be able to like hold me to everything I say on BDE. <laughs> yeah. or Chuck Yates hey, Chuck, you said this. Yeah, Chuck's like just for the audience. Chuck's like, I, is, I lead the audience and saying, or I lead the platform and saying fart. I'm like, Chuck, this is a research product. Can you please use it? And <laughs> now, the the worst thing about being around digital wildcatters here with these guys sitting in front of DW Insights is I'll make some pronostication about you know something. Oh, this is what's going to happen, and two seconds later, it's like. Do you remember when you said this? And it's some stupid thing I said two years ago, like <laughs> oil's going to 150, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It, but it's, um, it's really the content search engine that we have already is, it's pretty amazing. And I think that it'll continue to get more robust over time. But um, I think that like use cases will come from it that I didn't even see, like, you know, internally, one of our salespeople, Matt was using it. He had a sales call with someone and he knew that they spoke at Fuse. So he went and searched them up on Fuse and used it for biz dev um, to just get some more context and understanding of the things that they like talking about. And so um, the way that we're structuring that product is it's an annual subscription, um, enterprise subscription for EMPs. So 
if you're an EMP, you can pay on an annual subscription and you can get access to the startup database and the content search engine. But if you're just an individual and you want access to the, the content search engine, um, you can pay for that on an individual basis and um, have access to it. And so um, I think that that is just the more content that we dump into that thing. Um, it's just going to continue to get more powerful yeah. over time. No, I mean, all the, all the, I mean, all the ability in the future to suggest other stuff. Hey, you looked up mud, by the way, here's what's going on with permitting on certain things. Yeah, no, exactly. That, that's yeah. going to be really cool. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, allows us to also see over time, like as people are starting to query new things, it's like, what, like, how many results does that return? You know, for emissions, I know there's like 75 videos that have the word emissions in it, at least. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, if you look up something that's very, very particular, somebody gave me a word the other day and I was like, I've never even heard this word before. We had nothing on it. It's like, well, okay, well, maybe we should create some content around this. No, that's you know, exactly fill, like, right. Fill in the white spaces. Because I'll go out on Twitter and somebody will ask, how are, how are management fees calculated by private equity funds? And I'm like, doesn't everybody know that? Yeah. Nobody does. So I put out a tweet about it, you know, and all, you know, and people are liking it. People are messaging me. Holy cow. I didn't know how that worked. I put it out on collide. And, and the thing is, is that the technology d didn't exist to do this even a couple of years ago. Yeah. A couple of years ago, even a year ago. Um, you know, we've had the idea for collide for three years now and have really been developing the thesis, but it wasn't until the last year where, you know, like I said, digital wildcatters isn't a heavily funded Silicon Valley tech company. I can't go staff up a ton of data scientists and machine learning experts. Um, you know, these people make, you know, 500 grand a year over at Netflix. Um, and so now being able to take these technologies um, off the shelf, and it still requires a lot of development and tailoring, but the core technology exists to where um, it's now economically feasible to be able to build these things. And so um, it's a, you know, I think it's an exciting time and energy and energy tech and then it's also an exciting time just to be building tech because um some things exist that didn't exist a short time ago what's cool about so, it is we, we started off with the hardest thing first which is video and so if you can index video you know doing text and blogs and uh technical papers and all that kind of stuff it's actually it's, funny because we're easy. running like <laughs> we found this one problem it's funny how you always discover these problems as you're building things but uh we found one problem um <laughs> which is on some of our old podcasts, uh, you know, when we'd run, when we'd have sponsors or advertise, advertisers, like uh, Combo Curve used to be an advertiser. And so we'd have an overlay on the video that was like, that said Combo Curve. And so now when you search Combo Curve, it'll bring up that podcast because it says Combo Curve in the writing. And so um, it's funny, like, the tools are so good that you have to figure out, you know, some yeah. of those second it, order of yeah, yeah. It hack, doesn't just but... detect speech. Like we can actually like any words that are on the screen, it can map that. Yeah, it's it got can... computer vision. So um, individual people. Like yeah. I think you're actually mapped. I don't think you're the only one so that's for us map. So if you type in Colin, yeah, like, anything that the anything that I'm in. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a pretty cool feature too. So um, I didn't get mapped first. All right. <laughs> Fine. We'll map you. <laughs> we'll, we'll map you. Yeah. Well, I'm glad this didn't turn into a job review. <laughs> this is our one on one session. <laughs> I was going to ask for a raise, but maybe not. Do have, uh, I went out on Twitter yesterday and I said, Hey, man, I'm going to have the guys on the podcast and we're just going to kind of talk. I have no idea where it's going to go. Got any questions? Do have a couple of questions. So we'll end it. I'm curious. With a couple of questions. These are. From somebody who shall remain nameless, Kermit. Okay. <laughs> Have they ever gotten into a, into a physical altercation with each other? <laughs> Outside of jiu-jitsu, no. No. So, uh, We've grappled with each other at jiu-jitsu, but not a physical altercation. Have, have you ever seen each other naked? <laughs> I'm creeped out by this. All right, you want to hear a funny story? <laughs> <laughs> no, here's the closest that uh, Jake's probably seen, seen me naked is uh, we're at Toby Rice's house. And <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Toby is Toby's like, gonna listen sucking to this. on the bank right now. <laughs> okay. Toby's stress level just through the roof, <laughs> just hitting that vape right Mine now. Mine too, Toby. Uh, I have a so photo. At, I have a photo at, of this. But we're at Toby's. We're at Toby's house, and uh, you know we're we're um, down in down in the basement bowling, drinking a little bit of whiskey, and I can't remember what happened. I said I, I said I was 180 pounds. He's like, you're not 180 pounds. He's like, yeah, dude, I'm 180 pounds. He's like, no, you're not. So like, come here and down in their basement you know they have a gym and he's got this like 
really fancy scale that like does like body 3D fat. measurement. It's like, yeah. get in your, get in your underwear now. Get in your underwear. <laughs> and so I, <laughs> I stripped down and I'm like in my boxers and Toby's just sitting there like analyzing this scale and Jake's got a picture of it. It's uh, Toby analyzing me and me sitting there. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just show you, Chuck. I'm not going to show the camera, but. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> I just got a text because, you know, I'm hooked into DW Insights. EQT has just withdrawn from their contract. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, here's, even fun. here's Toby in the picture. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> trying, trying to get the. That's got some meme. That's got some meme potential right there. Uh, that, we've kept that. That's that's got potential that needs to be destroyed. We've kept that's that one. Kind of the, we've kept that, that one has. in the vault. <laughs> All right. Do either of you have a skin allergy to baby oil? <laughs> Not to baby oil, no. Because the the punchline to Kermit's tweet is. Would they entertain a pay-per-view event that involves the first three questions? <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering where he's going with the baby oil. He, he tied it all uh, he tied together. It all. As Kermit is. Hey, like I said, I'll do anything for $10,000 a month. So. There we go. <laughs> there we go. It's a really low bar. <laughs> all right. That was, the, that was the worst of the questions on Twitter? Yeah, That's, that was the worst. I, I think, uh, I think uh, Lee Sperg came in with Ryan Reynolds or uh, what's the other Ryan? Uh, Gosling? Gosling. Gosling. Oh, Ryan Reynolds, 100%. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Nice. Not like Ryan Reynolds. He's funny, dude. Yeah. He's funny, yeah. I think Trashy, uh, Mikuel Trash had some uh, questions, but I, I missed them. Sorry, Trashy. Apologize to you, Trashy. Dude, this was cool. This was kind of fun. Yeah, this was yeah. fun. So I <laughs> for... doubt anybody's going to watch it. But it, was, <laughs> yeah. it, was, it turned into a fun it little state of the union. When Chuck started, when he, before we got on the podcast, he's like, I've actually never asked y'all how y'all met. And, um, Jake's answer answer was grinder, um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's good to tell you how we met. So there you go, cool dudes. How I met my mother. <laughs> <Your mother. laughs> I botched the title. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, right. you did. All right, dudes. Thanks for coming on. Yeah.